So now we're going to talk about the final step in the central dogma, translation. And that's the process of taking that single-stranded mature RNA molecule, prokaryotic or eukaryotic, and having the ribosome, which is a pair of proteins called the small subunit and the large subunit, which are often diagrammed as two different bubbles, a large one and a small one. And those two proteins together, the large and the small subunits, which, by the way, have ribosomal RNA incorporated in them, which do some structural things for the ribosomes, how those two proteins will read the messenger RNA molecule and produce the protein. So this is where protein synthesis happens. And this is all taking place, as we saw earlier, in the cytoplasm. After this transcript, the messenger RNA molecule exits the nucleus in a eukaryote after, pro after processing, or in a prokaryote, there is no nucleus, so transcription happens. And translation can occur at the same time that RNA polymerase is transcribing this gene, which is crazy, but very cool for prokaryotes. Now, the way that the translation actually happens is that there are a separate set of RNA molecules called transfer RNA molecules. So we have three different types of RNA now on the screen already. We've got the messenger RNA, we've got ribosomal RNA, those are components of the ribosome, and these are examples of those types of genes where the point of transcription is to produce RNA, and that's it. No translation of these RNA molecules happens. They're meant to be RNA molecules. That's their job. Transfer RNA molecules have a particular structure called a cloverleaf structure, where there are three hairpins that form a cloverleaf, and each of these molecules contains in one of those loops what's called the anticodon loop. And that is complementary to three nucleotide units that are called codons. And a codon is a set of three nucleotides of RNA that encode one amino acid. And so there is a different TNR, tRNA molecule. There are sometimes multiple tRNA molecules for every amino acid. So for example, this transfer RNA molecule might be, and they are, tRNAs physically attached to the amino acids. So the ribosome's job is tRNA molecules bind to the ribosome. And the ribosome checks to see does the anticodon base pair with the part of the messenger RNA molecule that the ribosome is currently located at? And if it does match, the ribosome takes the amino acid off of the tRNA and adds it onto the end of the protein. Hence, the protein grows. Protein is synthesized from the end terminus to its C terminus. So the very C terminal end of the protein will be the last amino acid that gets added on. Now, the first amino acid in Every protein, prokaryotic or eukaryotic, is methionine, abbreviated MET, three-letter code, or just M, a single-letter code. And its codon is AUG. So that part of the transcript that the ribosome is bound to, bound to right now is AUG. That would be the first place where the ribosome starts the process of translation. So the question of translation initiation, rather, is how does the ribosome find where it's supposed to start translating this messenger RNA molecule? Ribosomes don't start with the first codon, the first three letters, the first three nucleotides in the RNA. They have to find the correct AUG or start codon. And eukaryotes and prokaryotes do this slightly differently. In a prokaryote, one of these ribosomal RNAs is complementary to a sequence that's in the 
that's present in every messenger RNA, or RNA molecule in this case. Eukaryotes don't have messenger RNAs, they're just called RNAs or transcripts. There's a shine dalgarno sequence, a specific consensus sequence of nucleotides that base pairs with one of these RNAs that's in the ribosome. And that's what positions, that's where the ribosome actually forms on the RNA molecule, is at the shine dalgarno sequence based on complementation between that ribosomal RNA gene and this DNA sequence. And it's not important that you remember what the shine dalgarno sequence is, I'm not going to tell you. But the point is, it is present at the upstream 5' prime end of every transcript in a prokaryote. That's how transcription in, or translation initiation happens. Things are slightly different, so that should actually not say M if we're talking about a prokaryote. Here, let's talk about eukaryotes. We can call this a messenger RNA. Now remember, part of the messenger RNA molecule is a 7-methylguanine cap on the 5' prime end. So the way translation starts in eukaryotes is that the small ribosomal subunit will bind to the 7-methylguanine cap, it uses it as an anchor. It knows, okay, this is the 5' prime end of this messenger RNA molecule. And then that small subunit moves towards the 3' prime end of the messenger RNA molecule until it finds and recognizes that AUG. If it's carrying with it a transfer RNA molecule that has a methionine in it. So its anticodon loop, imagine that in this small subunit we have that clover leaf, it's carrying methionine, and if it's meant to base pair with AUG, you can imagine that the anticodon is complementary. C-A-U, U-A-G, those will be able to base pair with each other, and the ribosome will incorporate, start the translation of the protein with that amino acid, methionine. When that small subunit's bound to the first AUG that it encounters, moving from the 5' prime end to the 3' prime end, first AUG, that's where translation begins. And the next step, this ribosome will move to the next codon. So there's three nucleotides there. AUG will move to the next three. That's codon one, moves to codon two. That would be nucleotides four, five, and six. Let's say that was CCC, codon two. CCC encodes proline. So the next thing that would happen is a transfer RNA with an anticodon loop that is what? GGG would come in. This has got proline attached to it. And the ribosome would take that transfer RNA with the proline, stick the proline onto the end of the methionine using a peptide bond, and keep moving every three nucleotides, adding the next nucleotide. Then we get to the process of elongation. That's what we're talking about right now. This process of the addition of new amino acids to the carboxy terminus, the C terminus, of the growing chain of amino acids, it's basically the same in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So is termination, how translation stops. It turns out the messenger RNA molecule not only is part of the messenger RNA molecule not translated, the part between the 5' prime end of the molecule and the first AUG, this part, is not translated. That's called the 5' prime UTR, untranslated region. It's also true that translation stops before, usually, before the ribosome gets to the 3' prime end of the messenger RNA molecule. So here's the 3' prime end, and translation stops when a stop codon is encountered. There are three different stop codons, UAG, UAA, and UGA. And if, when, 
a ribosome arrives at one of those three codons, there are no transfer RNA molecules that match with their anticodon those three codons. And so the ribosome stops. It doesn't know what to do. It doesn't have a transfer RNA come in and bring an amino acid. And when that ribosome stops at the stop codon, another protein called a release factor enters the ribosome and causes the small and the, sub, small and the large subunits to fall off of the RNA molecule and translation ceases. So geneticists know which three nucleotides, that is which codon, and there are 64 of them, correspond to which amino acid. And so what I'm going to show you next is an image of a codon table. And this is how geneticists take the three nucleotides of a codon and figure out which amino acid that codon encodes. So here you go. Here is a codon table. And the way the codon table can be read is you can see each three-letter codon, like C, U, U. Remember, each codon is three nucleotides of the RNA transcript, the messenger RNA molecule, that are read by the ribosome during translation. So if a ribosome encountered a C, U, G, for example, then a leucine, or L-E-U, the three-letter code, L, single-letter code, would be incorporated into the C-terminal end of the growing polypeptide, the protein. The way the codon table can be read most easily is that on the first axis here, that's the first letter in each codon. So in this case, U is the first letter, C is the first letter, A is the first letter, and so on. Then across the top, you, f you locate the second letter in the codon that you're trying to find the amino acid for, and then the third letter in the codon is on this axis. So if I told you, or if you found, for example, that you had a messenger RNA that you were translating by hand, and the messenger RNA's sequence was AUGCAA UAG, you'd first look up the th three nucleotides, AUG. So you'd find A in the first position, U in the second position, and then G in the third, and that's methionine. And then CAA. We've got C in the first position, A in the second position, and A in the third position. That's glutamine, GLN, or Q. And then the third codon here, UAG, is a stop codon. UAG, end. And those are often represented as asterisks. Now you'll notice that, again, as I've already said, there are 20 amino acids, but there are 64 different codons in this table, which means there's going to be some redundancy. For example, here are two different codons, CAU and CAC, that both encode the amino acid histidine. And what I'd like you to do for class is to look at this table for a couple of minutes and see what sort of patterns you notice. Are there trends in the redundancy and What's the diversity present in the number of codons that encode different amino acids? We'll talk about this more in class. So to practice your knowledge of the process of translation now, here's a protein sequence using single letter amino acid code. Okay, pretty straightforward. What I'd like you to do with this is to write out the messenger RNA sequence that could, a messenger RNA sequence that could encode this polypeptide. Use the codon table to do this. And then how many different, this is important, how many different messenger RNA sequences other than the one you wrote out could produce this polypeptide sequence? Finally, well, that's one. So, how many different ways are there for a transcript to encode the same polypeptide sequence? And then pick one and actually write it out. So mRNAs that produce 
that peptide sequence. Second, using exon Hmm. Let's see. Alternative usage. That was the case where you could have exons one, two, three, and four. And after splicing, you could either get exons one, three, and four or exons 2, 3, and 4. Okay, this is the alternative usage. You either get exon 1 or exon 2, but neither both. Use that and see if you can come up with a way to have the same transcript encode both this message, have a nice day, and also have a splice day. So you should have a messenger RNA that will encode this and this at the same time, but depending on how they're spliced, they'll produce one or the other protein. And finally, take this messenger RNA sequence. There it is, in all of its glory. And pretend your eukaryotic ribosome translate this messenger RNA sequence and bring the protein that it encodes with you to class next time.